Hello and welcome to this video on chemistry paper 1. I'm going to cover the contents for separate science only, so all the other content that you'll need is in the combined and separate video, and this just covers the extra things that you need to know if you are taking the longer exam, which is an hour and 45 minutes each. So the topics that are in paper 1, topics 1 to 5 still, and we're just going to go through the extra bits of information that you need to know. For topic one, there's only one extra piece of um, content, and that's comparing the transition metals with the alkali metals. So let's start off by remembering where these different metals are. Group one is the alkali metals, and the transition metals are the metals in the block between groups two and three. And let's start off there with one very special property of the transition metals, in that they can um, can form ions with different charges. So for example, iron here, some atoms of iron can form an Fe2 plus charge and some of them can form an Fe3 plus charge. So they form different charged ions. They also form really colourful compounds. You might have seen them in the science lab where they um, produce different coloured powders and ionic compounds that you might have used. They're also really useful catalysts. If you remember a catalyst is something that lowers the activation energy in a reaction by providing an alternative pathway so it speeds up a reaction and some useful ones that you might need to remember is that iron is used as a catalyst in the harbour process and nickel is a catalyst used in the hydrogenation process when you add hydrogen to unsaturated alkenes to make them saturated. So a couple of different examples, you may need to um, remember at least one of those if you are asked for an example. So compared with the alkali metals, this question is talking about comparing, so we must use words such as higher, lower, bigger, stronger, etc. So compared with the alkali metals, transition metals have higher melting points and boiling points. So by saying higher instead of high, we are giving our comparison there by saying they're higher. Compared with the alkali metals, the transition metals are, well there are several things we can say, they're stronger. Again, comparing, they are harder, they are denser or more dense. And in terms of reactivity, the transition metals here are less reactive with things such as oxygen, water and the halogens, three things that you need to know about reacting with group one. So the halogens are group seven, the Transition metals are less reactive when they react with things such as oxygen, water and halogens compared to group 1, which are really reactive metal elements. For topic 2, the only extra piece of um, separate only content is nanoscience. And quite simply, nanoscience is the study of very small particles. There's three different size particles you need to know about. You need to know about nanoparticles which are between 1 and 100 nanometers. Slightly bigger than that between 100 and 2500 nanometers you'll find the fine particles and the biggest ones that you need to be aware of are coarse particles which are between 2500 and 10,000 nanometers. Coarse particles are otherwise known as dust. So these fine and coarse particles have a little shorthand. We call the fine ones PM 2.5, which is in relation to their size here, maximum size, and coarse are PM 10, in relation again to their maximum size. So nanoparticles are something that's getting scientists very interested because they can be applied to a number of different things. Their main best property is the fact that they have a large surface area to volume ratio. So they are really useful as things such as catalysts 
They link to the fullerenes in this topic because they are being developed in several different medicines. For example, this Buckminster fullerene is an example of a nanoparticle because it's only made up of 60 carbon atoms and nanoparticles are particles that are made up of only um, up to a few hundred atoms. So in the medicine, this nanoparticle is being developed for drug delivery in the body. Some of the, the nanotubes that you would have looked at for the fullerenes as well are being used in electronics because they conduct electricity. They're also used, these nanoparticles, in cosmetics and sun creams because of their large surface area to volume ratio. They give a really good coverage without using so much volume of the liquid. And the final one that you need to be aware of are silver nanoparticles because these have antibacterial properties. If you have silver in contact with bacteria, it will, it will kill the bacteria. So they're looking to develop these and integrate these into certain pieces of, of um, garments such as socks so that your socks would have anti antibacterial properties because of the silver nanoparticles and therefore your feet would keep smelling fresh for longer. One thing that you need to be aware of with the um, surface area to volume ratio is the fact that they might ask you to calculate surface area to volume ratio. So make sure that you can do that, remembering that a cube has six sides. So the area of one side multiplied by six gives the surface area and the volume is the length by width by height. An important relationship that you need to know for cubes is that if the size of the side of a cube decreases by a factor of 10, the surface area to volume ratio will increase by a factor of 10. So if, for example, you had a cube with 6 centimetres, of all of its sides were 6 centimetres, and you decreased that by a factor of 10, so that you had a, size of a cube with sides of 0.6, centimeters. In terms of surface area to volume ratio, if you were to calculate those, you'd actually be increasing the surface area to volume ratio by tenfold and by a factor of 10. And that links into the fact that um, smaller um, objects or in biology, smaller organisms have a larger surface area to volume ratio. So again, if you decrease the size by a factor of 10, you will increase the surface area to volume ratio by a factor of 10. Topic 3 has a few extra calculations, a couple of those are higher tier only. This first calculation is something that you'll actually need to do in the combined content as well, um, but I want to make you aware that mass calculations, like you would have seen before, um, link into theoretical mass or theoretical yield, and I'll explain what I mean in a minute. That links into percentage yield, which you need to know for foundation. Um, we'll look at atom economy and finally gas calculations. So first of all, what do I mean by these mass calculations? Well, hopefully, hopefully you'll recognise this kind of idea, that you might be asked a question like how much sodium chloride would be produced from 50 grams of hydrochloric acid. So you would have done this before, how much sodium chloride is what you're asking can be produced from 50 grams of hydrochloric acid. So there's our 50 grams and we're seeing how much sodium chloride we're going to make. So we don't need to worry about those two. We work out the relative formula mass of each one. So HCl would be 36.5 and NaCl would be 58.5. And we'd divide both sides by 36.5 to get that to 1, so 1 would make 1.6. We just divided both sides by 36.5. If you're not sure how I've done this, then you'll, um, you can look back at other videos on how to do mass calculations, but I'm just doing this quickly. Um, so multiply that by 50, because we need to know what 50 grams is going to make. So 50 grams would make 
80 grams because we've multiplied it by 50. So now this value here is what I want to focus on. This is our theoretical yield. Okay, this is what we get from doing our mass calculations. This is saying that if all of the 50 grams of hydrochloric acid reacted how we wanted, we would make theoretically 80 grams of sodium chloride. So this next se section is for higher and foundation tier and it's all about percentage yield. With the higher tier, we just very quickly just did this mass calculation, which is higher tier only. But through this calculation, we said that 50 grams of hydrochloric acid should make 80 grams of sodium chloride. Now, if you're doing foundation, they'll give this figure for you. Um, but this question says, when 50 grams of hydrochloric acid reacted with sodium hydroxide, 77 grams of sodium chloride was produced. So we were expecting 80 grams, but actually only 77 grams was made. So we need to calculate percentage yield to calculate the percentage that we actually made. So we do that by this calculation. Percentage yield is your actual yield that you got, which is our 77, divided by our theoretical yield, which is what we expected to get using our maths, multiplied by 100. So if we do that, we get 77 divided by 80, multiply it by 100, and that gives us our percentage yield of 96.25%. What you'll notice is that is not 100%. That is because we need to be aware that yield is never 100% percent for these following reasons. Some product might be lost on separation, so for example if you are filtering out the product into a conical flask and you had your filter paper in there, some of it may well get stuck to the filter paper and may not all filter down into your conical flask. So some of it might be lost while you try and separate it. The reaction might be reversible, remembering the symbol for reversible reaction is like so. So if you notice that, it means that some of the products might be turning back into the reactants. And finally, the reactants might react differently from expected. So that might be, for example, metals in your reaction reacting with oxygen in the air. So if you wanted magnesium to react with hydrochloric acid to make magnesium chloride and hydrogen, what might happen is some of this magnesium might react with oxygen in the air and create something else. So you're not going to end up with those atoms in your final product. So remember, these three things are why yield is never 100%. Atom economy is for both foundation and higher. And this is the equation that we need to remember for atom economy. It's the relative formula mass of your desired products divided by the relative formula mass of all your reactants multiplied by 100. So with every chemical reaction, there is some, there's a reason why you're doing it and there's something that you actually want to make. And the rest of the products are just byproducts um, of the reaction. So if we look at this question, it says calculate the atom economy of the following reaction to produce calcium chloride. So this is what we want to make, and then this water is just a byproduct that's also produced. So the atom economy is the percentage of the products in terms of their relative formula mass um, out of the whole of the reactants. So what you'd need to do is calculate the relative formula mass of your desired product, because that's number one up here. And then secondly, work out the relative formula mass of all your reactants. So using the atomic masses on the periodic table, calcium is 40, chlorine is 35.5. So two of those added 40 will give you 111. Relative formula masses of these, well, this is 1, 35.5, 40 and 16. There's two of these ones, and all combined, that would make 73 add 56, so that would give 129. So, we then do our calculation. We've got the relative formula mass of our desired products, and our relative formula mass of our reactants. So, 111 
divided by 129 times by 100 gives us our atom economy of 86%. Gas calculations are for higher tier only, and for these you'll need to learn another equation, which is this one here, that the volume of a gas equals mass divided by MR multiplied by 24. And remember, in case you need it, you might need to link it to this equation, that moles equals mass divided by MR. So you could have the volume of gas equals moles times 24, because if we substitute this in, mass divided by MR is the same as moles. So for ex the things you need to know, the units, the volume of gas is measured in decimeters cubed. So if you ever see it in centimeters cubed, you must convert it to decimeters cubed by dividing by a thousand. Mass is measured in grams. Now in physics, mass is always in kilograms and if ever you have to see it you have to convert it but for chemistry because we're talking about such small amounts we're measuring things in grams so leave it as that so I know it's confusing but this one says the volume what is the volume of 500 grams of oxygen at room temperature now it will say room temperature because we're talking about these volumes at room temperature and standard pressure of one atmosphere. So standard room temperature and pressure. So 500 grams is the mass, so 500 divided by the relative formula mass of this, which is two lots of 16 at 32, multiplied by 24, because that's our standard constant, and that gives us 375 decimeters cubed. Second question, what is the volume of 44 grams of carbon dioxide? Well, 44 divided by the relative formula mass, which is 12 plus of 2 lots of 16, which is 44, multiplied by 24, and that gives us 24 decimeters cubed. This is no coincidence that this number here is this number up here, because this we've worked out as one mole, because mass divided by MR is moles, so 44 divided by 44 is 1. And there is a rule that says 1, oh, write it in pen, that 1 mole of any gas at room temperature or uh, pressure occupies 24 decimeters cubed. So one mole of any gas at standard room temperature and pressure will occupy 24 decimeters cubed. Linking on from our, from our previous idea, we also have um, this idea here that at equal temperature and pressure, equal numbers of moles of any gas will occupy the same volume. So with a balanced equation, you can see the ratios of moles of gases within an equation. So for example here we've got one mole of nitrogen to three moles of hydrogen to two moles of ammonia. In this question here, because we know the ratios of moles that are reacting together, if we had 20 decimeters cubed of nitrogen, um, we could answer these questions. What volume of hydrogen would you have? Well there's three times more hydrogen, so you'd have 60 decimeters cubed of hydrogen. And what volume of ammonia would you have? Well, there's two times the volume of ammonia, so you just have 40 decimeters cubed of ammonia. The separate only topics for topic four are the titration required practical and the titration calculations for higher tier only that go along with that. So this is the type of question that you will be able to work out using a titration. It says, how much alkali do I need to neutralise 50 centimetres cubed of 0.1 mole per decimetres cubed sulfuric acid? So this is the volume that we have, and this is the concentration. So we start off with our sulfuric acid, uh, and it's of known concentration. We know this is 0.1 moles per decimetres cubed. So we're going to use 50 centimetres cubed of this, and this is where our pipette comes in, and our pipette can accurately, accurately measure a known volume. 
So we will use a pipette holder, which will be like a rubber ball on top to help draw up the liquid. We would put this pipette in our acid and draw up as much as we needed. So this one's a 25ml one, so we'd need two of these all together, but you get the idea, 50 mils in here, because this is what we said we're using, 50 centimetres cubed of acid. Into that, we need to add an indicator, and this is where our phenylphthalein indicator comes in. Phenylphthalein um, is a good indicator because it has a very specific end point. You can't use universal indicator because that has a really wide range of colours that it goes through, whereas phenylphthalein has a specific end point. In acid, it will start off colourless in acid and then it will go pink when it's neutralized okay so this one here as we start it we add a few drops of phenylphthalein and then it starts off as colorless we then need to start using this piece of equipment which is attached to a clamp stand and this is our burette into our burette we put our alkali and we fill it right up to the top if we zoomed that up top of the burette would have a zero on it and as we fill the burette with our alkali we need to get the bottom of the liquid line touching the zero. This is called our meniscus so we'd keep adding the liquid until our meniscus reached the zero line. What we then do is open up our tap here and drop by drop we would add our acid, our alkali into our acid. So we'd add alkali into the acid and we would swirl it. And this is a very gradual process, but what we're looking for is a colour change. To help us out, we would often put a white tile under here just so that the colour change is really, really obvious. So you might see that on your equipment list, a white tile. And gradually, if we're uh, dripping into there and swirling this will change from colorless to pink and we can stop and measure the volume of alkali needed to neutralize that amount of acid. For higher tier only then we need to take these um, measurements of volume that we've taken from the titration and we can then use that to work out the, cal the concentration of the alkali. So, if in the previous experiment we worked out that we needed 110 centimetres cubed of sodium hydroxide to neutralise our 50 centimetres cubed of sulfuric acid, then we can calculate the concentration of sodium hydroxide. We need to remember another equation to be able to do this, and that is moles equals concentration multiplied by volume. So what I recommend you do is have a look at your equation and first of all make sure it's balanced because we need it to be balanced to work out the ratio of moles in just a minute. And we need this side of the equation. I always draw a little table so you can have your alkali and your acid and write down the three components that you need to work out. The moles, the concentration and the volume for each one and write those in the same order. Then, first of all, extract from the information they've given you in the question everything that you can and add it to your table. So we've got a volume for sodium hydroxide or alkali, we've got a volume for acid, and we've got a concentration for acid. Now, the volume is really important because they will try and trip you up by giving you the volume in centimetres cubed. You must convert that to decimetres cubed by dividing by a thousand. So I tend to write it in my table like that so I don't forget. So the alkali volume would be 110 divided by a thousand and the acid volume would be 50 divided by a thousand. For the concentration of the acid we know that as 0.1 and the concentration of the alkali I always put as a question mark because that's what we want to work out. So using the calculation up here, 
because we've got two components here, so that should be a five, it doesn't look like a five. We've got two components here, we can calculate the moles by doing concentration multiplied by volume. And if we did that, we would have the number of moles as 0 0.005. This is where the balanced equation comes in. You need to look at the ratio of moles in the equation. You can see that the ratio is two lots of alkali to one lot of acid. So the ratio of alkali to acid is 2 to 1. If it was 1 to 1, so there was no 2 here, we could just write the same number of moles over on this side, 0 0.005, but because it's double the number of moles, we have to double the number of moles here. So the number of moles of the alkali would actually be 0 0.01 moles. And then finally, we can now work out our concentration by rearranging our equation to say concentration equals moles divided by volume. So we take our moles, 0.01, and divide it by 110 divided by 1,000, which is, of course, the same as 0.11. So if we do 0.01 divided by 0.11, we get our concentration of 0 0.09 grams per decimeters cubed and that is our answer to our question. So I really recommend you drawing it out on the table with your moles concentration volume, remembering that the equation is balanced and you must remember this equation here to be able to do these titration calculations. The two final topics are for topic 5 and they are cells and fuel cells. Now you'll recognise cells from physics, um, where you would recognise the cell, the circuit symbol for a cell like so, and it will have a certain potential difference, say it had 2 volts for example, and you'll also know that if you put several cells together, then you, uh, the total potential difference across all of them is the sum of the potential difference is across all the cells. So if each of those is 2 volts, then the total potential difference across all of them would be 6 volts. But for chemistry, you need to go into um, detail about how a cell is actually made. And in essence, it is formed from an e electrolyte, similar to what you would have seen in electrolysis that contains ions, so an ionic compound, for example, sodium chloride. And crucially, the electrodes must be made out of two different materials, mainly metals, because they have to be something that conducts electricity. So, for example, this could be made out of copper, and this could be made out of zinc. And when our electrolyte reacts with our electrodes, because they're different metals, they will create a difference in charge. And that is going to um, create our potential difference, which obviously if we're connected to wires and a, and a complete circuit, we will allow electricity to flow. With two different metals, they will have different properties, and one of those properties will be their reactivity. And in fact, the closer they are on the reactivity series, the lower the potential difference they will create. So we can use a voltmeter, just like we would in the physics circuits, to measure the potential difference or the voltage between the electrodes, across the electrodes. So with two um, metals that are close to each other on the re reactivity series, they're going to create a low voltage. But if the metals are really far apart from each other on the reactivity series, they are going to create a really high potential difference. So that's quite a key one that we'll write down. The bigger the difference in reactivity between the metals, the bigger the potential difference is going to be across those electrodes. And also the electrolyte itself, depending on what that is, that can also affect the potential difference. So different electrolytes will give a um, bigger or a smaller voltage across the electrodes.
because of the way that they're reacting with these metals here so that can also affect the potential difference. With these cells here we often connect them um, together as batteries and you will have heard of two different types of batteries um, one that it is non-rechargeable, most batteries are non-rechargeable that's because um, the electrodes or the electrolyte will gradually wear away until there is none of it left, it's all used up in the reaction so non-rechargeable batteries, things such as alkaline batteries have irreversible reactions once those electrodes and the electrolyte is used up that is it, your battery will run out. However you can have rechargeable batteries, they tend to be more expensive because they'll last longer and they re the reaction is reversed, so it's a reversible reaction when it's connected to an electrical current. The final separate only piece of content is looking at fuel cells and, and the main fuel cell that you need to be aware of is a hydrogen oxygen fuel cell and this is where technology is going to produce cleaner fuels because hydrogen and oxygen only produce water so the overall reaction for this is hydrogen gas reacting with oxygen gas to produce water. So unlike burning other fuels, um, we only get water and heat as products and we don't get the carbon monoxide and sulfur dioxide and nitrous oxides that you associate with burning carbon-based fuels. So this is what a fuel cell um, will look like. In the left-hand side, you will have hydrogen going in, on the right hand side you'll have oxygen going in and coming out you will have water and heat. So that's the essence of it, we're reacting hydrogen and oxygen to produce water and heat. But these fuel cells can also generate electricity as well. And they need to do so for the reaction to happen. Now with fuel cells the annoying thing is is that everything you've learned about electrodes for electrolysis is turned on its head. So in electrolysis we call the positive electrode the anode and we call the negative electrode the cathode but in a fuel cell you will call the negative electrode the anode and you will call the positive electrode the cathode. So that's the confusing bit to get your head around. So these two here are representing electrodes. So this here is our negative electrode or our anode and this here is our positive electrode or our cathode. So the hydrogen goes in and it's unlike electrolysis, in electrolysis you're talking about ions that are charged going to the electrodes and either gaining or losing electrons. In this case, in a fuel cell, you're talking about molecules going in and reacting with the electrodes when they get there. So this electrode is a porous electrode, which I've tried to show by the uh, dotted lines here. And what happens is the hydrogen will go here and it will lose electrons and turn into hydrogen ions. The electrons flow around the circuit and the hydrogen ions move through the porous membrane towards the oxygen. This bit is for higher tier only and that is the half equation that we've, um, we've just described. So for higher you will need to know the half equation which says that the hydrogen loses electrons and turns into hydrogen ions and then gives away the electrons and this of course because it's losing electrons is called oxidation. So the hydrogen ions can move through the porous membrane and they move their, their way over here at which point you've got the oxygen coming in 
and we get another reaction at this electrode between the hydrogen ions and the oxygen to produce water. So the electrons are also involved, the electrons have flown around here to this electrode and at this point we've got hydrogen ions, electrons and uh, oxygen molecules and that generates water. So for higher tier only you will need to know the half equation for this side. So the half equation then, we've got the oxygen molecules reacting with hydrogen ions that have moved across here and also electrons to produce water and the numbers in front are just balancing everything up so oxygen reacting with the hydrogen ions and the electrons to produce water and because it's gaining electrons this is reduction reaction so where we've got reduction and oxidation we are talking about redox reactions in this process. So the details of this are pretty complicated and hopefully will only appear in the higher tier paper in terms of the half equations and how it works but in essence we need to know that these fuel cells are using hydrogen and oxygen to produce water and heat and you'll need to explain the, the advantages of this, um, for example, rather than using conventional fuel, it's not going to, to release as many pollutants in the atmosphere like carbon monoxide and sulphur dioxide. Um, you could also compare it to electric cars. So electric cars are good because they don't produce the, um, the pollutants as well. But with electric cars, you'll have um, batteries containing... Um, finite materials and metals and some of them have toxic substances in as well um, so there's comparisons that can be made with the electric car as well.